Coming up on the Mindful Midlife Crisis. It's a really good thing. And seeing a whole wave of dads, for example, in the dad space who want to be the stay-at-home dads and, and they want to be there with their kids and, and teach their kids ways of dealing with emotional distress and being open and stuff like that. I tried it for a little while and it was amazing to be able to spend more time at home with the kids and stuff like that and challenge those social constructs of Men have to be the breadwinner. Men have to go out and, and work and the wife stays at home and all that type of stuff. And the more we can challenge this stuff and talk about it openly and honestly and so forth, I think the better that our future generations will be. I think this is a time where we're starting this mental health conversation and the more momentum we can get, the more we can we can normalise discussions around mental health, which is great what we're doing now, which is normalising a mental health discussion. It's not behind closed doors. It's going to be open for the whole world to hear it the further we can progress this this mindfully masculine guy for the future. Welcome to the Mindful Midlife Crisis, a podcast for people navigating the complexities and possibilities of life's second half. I'm your host, Billy Lahr, an educator, personal trainer, meditation teacher, and overthinker who talks to experts who specialize in social and emotional learning, mindfulness, physical and emotional wellness, cultural awareness, finances, communication, relationships, dating, and parenting, all in an effort to help us better reflect, learn, and grow so we can live a more purpose-filled life. Take a deep breath, embrace the present, and journey with me through the Mindful Midlife Crisis. Welcome to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. I'm your host, Billy Lahr. Thank you for tuning in wherever you are. The purpose of this show is to provide a platform that gives people the space and permission to share their expertise and life experiences in order to help others navigate the complexities and possibilities of life's second half. And remember, this free and useful information is helpful to people of all ages. Wisdom isn't about one's age. Wisdom comes from our ability to reflect, learn, and grow from our own life experiences while also learning from the experiences of others, regardless of what stage of life we are in. And you just never know what life is going to throw at you. So there just might be a story or two from these past episodes that help you feel better prepared for the challenges you might face in life or that you're facing right now, whether those challenges be your emotional, mental, and or physical health, your relationships with others, including your partner and your children, your career, whatever curveballs life is throwing at you right now, just know that you are not alone in your experiences and the conversations I'm having here are with people who have been there before or have done the research to help you navigate these situations with more awareness, openness, curiosity, and compassion so you can live a more purpose-filled life. So, If you're looking for some ways to help you better navigate whatever you've got going on in your life from someone who's been through it before, check out some of our other episodes at www.mindfulmidlifecrisis.com or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm breaking this week's episode into two parts because my guest and I, we had a lot to talk about when it comes to men's mental health. And as you can imagine, if you listen to my episode 66 rant about Chelsea Fagan's comment where she said, no more men talking mental health on podcasts, (laughs) I decided to double down on this conversation of men talking mental health on podcasts. So in today's episode, my guest shares his mental health journey battling OCD, anxiety, depression, and alcohol abuse. And then next week, we're going to talk about how his experiences have led him to devoting his life to being a social worker, providing mental health services to men, and how he counsels men, particularly fathers, who are struggling with their mental health and having a hard time opening up about it. All right, let's meet today's guest. Our guest today is Simon Rennie. Simon is a husband and father of two based in Australia along Queensland's Sunshine Coast, Simon is the founder of Mindful Men, a therapy practice that is dedicated to supporting men with mental illness and disability. Simon's passion for mental health comes from living with obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, anxiety, and burnout throughout the last 30 years. 2022 marks 10 years since Simon finally opened up and got help for his mental illness. 
and he is here today to share his story and inspire other men to share theirs. So welcome to the show, Simon Rennie. Thank you, Billy. It's good to be here, mate. It's good to catch up again. It's um, been a few long weeks since our last discussion. Yeah, yeah. So if people want to check out Simon's podcast, Simon has a podcast called Mindful Men, and I was a guest on there, and you can check that out. It was a lot of fun talking to you, and, and like we just kind of carried on for a while, and it was it, it is just it was a fun conversation. It was a lively conversation, so people can check that out. And I think today is also going to be just as spirited and informative, especially for men out there who may be hesitant to talk about their mental health. And I know that that's something that you're passionate about. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But we always like to have our guests talk about the 10 roles that they play in their life. So, Simon, what are the 10 roles that you play in your life? Mm, You had me thinking on this. So I always say husband first because my kids, I usually say dad first, but I'm trying to train my brain to say husband first because I met my (laughs) wife first and then I had kids. <laughs> wait, 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 why? Why? How come you're training your brain for that? <laughs> I don't know. I just don't want to disappoint my wife and, and think that I've put the kids before her. So well, maybe and it's okay equal, to disappoint the kids. <laughs> <laughs> they're not old enough yet to really understand. There, there, that that uh, makes sense. <laughs> maybe, maybe in twenty years I'll be disappointing them. I'm not sure because they're only little. They're only like three and five. So oh yeah, um, yeah. They maybe, don't care. Maybe they're equal. They're equal, number one. <laughs> and then I was, yeah, I'm a social worker. I like to consider myself a mental health influencer because I do a lot of, in, well, not influencing, but social media stuff with with mental health and men's mental health. And and the next, it flows into the next one, which is a men's therapist as well. So I work specifically for, with men, trying to help them to open up about mental illness. This one's an inter- the next one's an interesting one. I'm a therapist in therapy. I actually wrote therapist and therapist, but therapist in therapy, because there's a lot of stigma and shame around people who are therapists, like psychologists, counselors, social workers, etc. But, you know, who are also getting therapy themselves. And there's a lot of shame around that because they feel like they have to be strong mentally to be working in the mental health field. But, but there's a lot of us actually who, you know, need help as well. And and I value my role as a therapist, but also the value the therapist that I work with personally as well. So um, I like to put in that. Now, the next one is a great one that we had a chat with on my podcast. I'm a closet Mariah Carey fan. <laughs> Mariah Carey, as she comes out, we're recording this in December 2022. So, it's, you know, she's all over the radio with her Christmas songs at the moment. So it always reminds me of the very first CD I ever owned, which was a gift on my birthday from a friend from school. And it was uh, Mariah Carey's Daydream. So I always have a bit of a soft spot for Mariah Carey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sports fan. So Australians, very, you know, sports mad. I love my Aussie rules footy. I love my soccer. I've just, we just watched the World Cup here and basketball, golf, you name it. I love it. And <laughs> my kids are going to hate this when they're married, but I'm the best daggy dad dancer that the world has never seen. And it, it wouldn't be a party if it didn't bring out a chair at some point on the dance floor. <laughs> So, all right. So there are going to be a lot of terms that are used in this episode that are going to require some sort of ex- explanation because this is a mostly American audience right here. But what the hell is a daggy dad dancer? A daggy dad. Well, daggy is like, the, you know, the goofy dad, like the, the, the dorky dad that nobody wants on the dance floor, but he's just, he's waiting for that moment, that song. And then he gets that little bit of a jiggle with his backside and then off he goes. And the, and the wife is like, oh, my God. Uh, and what's funny is that's one of the roles that you're most looking forward to in the second half of yeah. life. So so not only are your kids going to be disappointed that you've put them second now as you've retrained your, your brain to look at them behind, you know, behind your wife as, as less prioritized as your wife. But they're also now looking forward to you embarrassing them, particularly at their wedding. Absolutely, and that's in like 25 years' time, so it's a long run-up. <laughs> uh, well, that gives you a lot of time to practice, or is it more important to just go in cold so then it's really embarrassing? Oh, you definitely have to go in cold, yeah. There's no practicing. It's not those flash mob things where all of a sudden everybody's in sync. It's just me. Just Interpretive dance is a good word for it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. So you're also looking forward to being a husband and being a father. And we've talked a little bit about this. Why are those roles that you're looking forward to in the second half of life? I guess because I just put them as number one and number one, you know, <laughs> it's, they're my world. My wife is my world in terms of both, you know, you know, where we've come from and, you know, our, our journeys together, but also my mental health journey, which is a huge part of my life. She is the one that encouraged me to go get help in the first place and, and it's really supported me through the last 10 years, particularly, but also the kids that like, that like my kids are my world and I love watching them grow up and trying to shape them into a human being that, you know, can make some good in the world and, and also hopefully impart some wisdom along the way. And yeah, hopefully I get the um, invite to the wedding as well. So I've obviously done a good enough job there as well. So yeah, they're the reason it's pretty simple stuff, really. Like, but they are the world that I live in and, and my world does revolve around them. So, Well, and we talked about in the conversation that we had that we really are, we're calling on men to seek out mental health help, but also encouraging their partners to, you know, encourage them to get them to say, Hey, you're really struggling. You're not really you. You're not the person that I, I first met. And it's not in a good way. You're not growing. And obviously, you, you, that's a really tricky conversation to have because men get on the defensive. So mm. I'm curious, how did you respond to that when your wife, what did your wife say and how did that impact you? Were you defensive? Were you like, that's not that's not what's going on here? Or were you aware of, yeah, you're right, you're right, and thank you for pushing me in that direction? Yeah, I, it, this question has me reflecting on, on a few different relationships in my life. Like, I remember the first few serious girlfriends that I had, like in my early, like late teens, early 20s and stuff like that. And even though at the time I had undiagnosed mental mental health issues, I tried to bottle it up, bottle it up with alcohol and and suppressing the the thoughts and the emotions. Tried to to not think about them or tried to outthink them as well in certain ways as well. But often those relationships would end because I found them trying to put me into their box about what an ideal partner would look like and, and be like, and that really conflicted with my mental health, like. As someone who's depressed, someone who lives with anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, there's certain ways that I think and feel and, and behave. But they were trying to stuff me into like almost like a you know a triangle into a square square hole or something like that. It just wasn't going to fit. And so when I met Rachel, and she was the first person who really just kind of like just kind of accepted me for who I was, um, and didn't I didn't feel like she was trying to fit me into her box about what an ideal partner would look like. But it did get to a stage where I wasn't showing up the way that I would like to show up. I was really depressed. Um, we'd moved from where we met to her hometown in, in Tassie and and I just felt really isolated and alone and, and down and, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. And initially she did say, oh, maybe you should go get some help because you're drinking too much. Um, like, and, I, and I was, like, a lot. And but I was deflective at first. I had the brick wall up and said, "No, I'm not going to do that. Maybe you've got issues. Maybe you need to go get help if you can't deal with what's going on." But deep down inside me, I also had this bit of a shame around medication. I didn't want to be one of those people that was on daily medication for the rest of their lives because I saw my parents, like particularly my mum, she would you know have a whole bunch of pills that she would take every day, and then you'd see it with your grandparents and stuff like that. And I'm like, it's just not a life that I wanted to live. So I thought I would do what most guys do and I'll go for a run, try to outrun it and, you know, try to get healthy, have a health kick, uh, drink a little bit less. Did that for a little while, didn't really work. And then a year later, we're having the same discussion. And it was at that moment where I go, okay, maybe there's some truth to this. I've been, I've been deflecting for a long time, not just that year before, but I was, you know, deflecting internally for a long time, saying nothing's wrong with me. Um, and that kind of, that was the moment where I said, okay, I think I do have a problem. I need to go and, and talk to talk to my doctor and start this process of what mental health is, um, what what recovery is, and and what that looks like as well. Was this before or after you had kids? Oh, well before, yeah. So this was ten years ago. So I've only the kids are only 
uh, Gussie's about to turn six, Pip's about to turn three. So yeah, this was 10 years ago. So Matron and I have been together since 2008. And so this was around, yeah, 2012 that this was all happening. But it was so good to do it, actually. Like, it started a 10-year process of recovery and, and finding what works for me and what doesn't work for me. And I found mindfulness on the way, which we'll talk about a bit later. And and I'm a big believer that, like, knowledge is power. And even though I, I was diagnosed from, from that initial discussion, I went to a, I got a referral to a psychologist, got the diagnosis of depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. And a lot of people say, oh, no, no. You know, mental illness labels don't define me. They, they don't. That's not who I am. But I, I really do. You know, in some way, think that what does define who I am because it helps me understand what's going on inside my brain and, and why I behave and the way I feel a lot of the time. And then from there, I can develop strategies to really, you know, work through the anxious periods or depressed periods, or even if it's little things like just having the inspiration to go talk to someone and the courage to go talk to someone, which is a huge one. And now I. It's so normal in my life that just like most people would go see a doctor if they hurt their leg or their back or whatever, get a, a physical injury, I'm just as ready to go say, okay, yeah, I need mental health support and I'll go see my doctor or a psychologist, counsellor, a social worker um, and work through whatever pain I was going through at the time. So it's quite a normal thing for me now. But, it, yeah, it wouldn't have happened without Rachel's support and, and then her support along the journey as well. It's, it's also about, you know, the honesty and openness about how I'm tracking ongoing and her support for me to go get the help when I need it and, and stuff like that. Because it is a bit of financial burden for a lot of people. It's not cheap to go see a psychologist. And, you know, my psychiatrist, I went to a psychiatrist this year to do a medication review and that was like 500 bucks, you know, just to go see someone for half an hour or so. Um, so it's not cheap, but I, I, it's it's high on my priority list because if I don't do it, then I'm not in a good space. Um, not not the best husband, not the best father that I can be. Um, and it's a work in progress as well. I never get it right, you know. So, but as long as I'm working towards health and well being, that's that's the most that I can do. Well, and it's that idea that mental health is health. And you know, you, you go mm-hmm. get a physical every year. You at least you should anyway. And we don't really have mental health protocols because general practitioners really aren't great about identifying mental health issues because they're not really trained in that. And so Hmm. I talked to Tandra Rutledge about this, about, man, I feel like we need to have some sort of mental health checklist, just like you you do when you have a a physical health checklist, right? Like you you hit 45 and and you get your prostate exam, and for women, you go in, you get mammograms, that sort of thing. I feel like we need to have a mental health checklist. So that's one thing that I like to work on as a project. So you know, you might get recruited to to help me with that because your story and your experiences have shaped a lot of the work that you're doing now. So what I want to do is this: we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Simon is going to share how his experiences have shaped the work in creating this Mindful Men movement. Thank you for listening to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. Thank you for listening to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. If you're enjoying what you've heard so far, please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Also, giving the show a quick five-star review with a few kind words helps others find and benefit from this podcast just like you are. Finally, Please spread the wealth of free knowledge and advice in this episode by sharing it with the people in your life who may find this information and my mission to help others live a more purpose-filled life valuable. My hope is that these conversations resonate with others and inspire people to live their best lives. Thanks again. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. We are here with Simon Rennie. He is the host of the Mindful Men podcast. You can check that out wherever you get your podcasts. Simon, you're a huge advocate, particularly for men's mental health, and you've been quite vulnerable and open about your own mental health journey. You've talked a little bit about that journey and and what you've learned about yourself. Tell us a little bit more about how you've learned to manage your depression, your anxiety, your OCD, your own recognition of it as well. Yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. It's, mental health journeys are a work in progress and it wouldn't have happened if I didn't open up about it. We're talking a bit about before around you know mental health checklists and, and all that type of stuff, but you, you're never going to get through 
to be able to do one unless you're open and honest and say, I've got an issue here. So I guess it's, it's I'm at a point now, you know, I'm 39, 40 next year where I'm at a point where, you know, I've learned that it's not weak to speak. I've learned to be able to take off the mask and go, okay, this is me. This is who I am authentically 100% because for a long time, I wore a very good mask of mental health. Nobody would know internally that I was really struggling. I was down, highly anxious, highly stressed, all that type of stuff because you wouldn't have seen seen it. Like you look at me and, and talk to me and and there would be, it would just be Simon's just doing his thing. And, and But internally, I was a completely different person. And so at this point in my time as a, as a dad particularly, I think the fatherhood has really brought it out a bit as well. It's like, it's like I want to be the best person I can be for my kids and being the best person I can be is being really 100% authentic. But it comes from a few different areas. I mean, I, I finished my social work degree last year. Um, social work does, is a great degree for anyone who's interested in learning how to critically reflect about life and identify how who we are as a person within our, I guess, within the micro, our micro family units or household units, and then how the the broader community influences how we operate as well in different environments. So that's been something that's been really useful in terms of my mental health journey and understanding where I'm at, but also where I've been from as well. And so I guess the story starts when I was, you know, I grew up in a place called Adelaide, South Australia, the northern suburbs. The geographical location is a lot of people on welfare support or low socioeconomic kind of people. A lot of people work in trades, manufacturing services style roles. So it's not exactly a wealthy area. It's probably on the lower end, low income, middle class as well, some of those pockets. And so, and I grew up in the 80s and 90s. So this is a time before social media, before internet, all that type of stuff. And so my world was informed by this environment that I lived in, um, which can be rough in certain suburbs and streets and so forth, but also like the household, you know, so I had three brothers uh, plus dad. So a very masculine household. We played Aussie rules football as well. Um, so it's quite, if you think of American football, but without the pads, um, that's what Aussie rules football is. It's quite a brutal sport, a lot of injuries and so forth. And you can get hit by any direction as well. So you think about a big oval of 18 players per each team and the ball's, you know, flinging around all over the place. It's not like you've got like, like, like NFL where you've got two teams facing each other and going at each other like that. It is, yeah, it is 360 kind of game and so in this kind of environment like in you know influenced by my brothers influenced by my my teammates my coaches if you get hit on the football field you've got to brush yourself off pick yourself up and off you go again because if you were someone who you know might cry on on the field if you got a big hit or whatever you'd you'd get targeted you you the big kids on the other team will look at you and go, I'm, I'm going to get this kid again because it's fun to hurt a little kid. But the same with your coach. If you weren't playing as the coach would would want you to play and as hard as the coach would want you to play, you'd get, you know, you'd get a spray or, or you'd get yelled at and in front of everybody. And it was quite demeaning and stuff like that. And that happened still today in 2022 and it's happened throughout history. But for me, I was internally, I was quite a sensitive kid. So if I did get yelled at, it would really cut down to my core. And but then, like I, I would also try to to hide the tears if I started to to, to tear up. And so you'd I'd have those kind of influences. And and I love football. I love playing it. But I wasn't the guy or the player who would be the one that would be on the bottom of a pack, getting crunched by ten guys. I'd be the guy on the outskirts using my speed to dart around and and to avoid getting tackled essentially. And then after that, we'd go home and we'd watch things like wrestling. We'd watch WWF wrestling, or it was, we we were more keen on WCW at the time. Or we'd watch, you know, my, my older brothers would watch the Terminator movies or you know, Rambo, Die Hard. These were common movies in our household. And so I quickly developed this idea of what it meant to be a boy and to be a man was to be tough and to be and to suck it up. And you know, you think of Die Hard and the Terminator, you're getting shot or stabbed or you know limbs cut off or whatever. But the guy, the, the hero, he picks himself up and carries on regardless. There's no tearing. There's no crying. But for a sensitive kid like me, that kind of clashed as well. Like I was like, how does this work? How do I navigate the world when, you know, the world's telling me that to cry is to be feminine? Like 
you know, and the 80s and 90s, if you were crying, say, in the schoolyard or even at home, like someone would say, oh, don't be a wuss, don't be a girl, you know, in, in some circles it was don't be gay, you know, like these were things that you would label with if you were a boy who showed any sort of emotion. And so like many boys and men, and particularly the men that I worked with, I bottled it up and I didn't talk about it, didn't know how to talk about it. Mental health wasn't even the dictionary, I don't think, back back then. And yes, yeah, so I just tried to go about my day as being as masculine as possible with a, quite a, a sensitive internal, you know, workings in my system. But up until around eight years old, I was pretty happy-go-lucky. I was pretty, you know, a larrikin. I didn't take much to heart. But then I developed obsessive compulsive disorder and my world changed. And internally, I was quite a mess. I didn't know how to process what was happening. I didn't know what was happening, what this thing was. And it wasn't until, you know, I was 28 and got diagnosed that I can go, oh, that's why I thought the way I did. That's why I behaved the way I did. And for anyone who's not sure what OCD actually is, it's it starts with an obsessive thought, which can be quite intrusive. It can be quite scary, quite um, demanding on the on the mind as well. And it would it, to to alleviate the distress that's caused by that obsessive thought, you can you perform what's called a compulsive act or a compulsion or a behaviour, and and the behaviour is meant to you know just to negate the thought and help you feel back at baseline again. So my entry into OCD started like it was around eight years old in the schoolyard and other students said to me, Simon, if you don't use your voice for more than a minute, you're going to lose your voice forever. And I'm like, I thought that was the gospel. I thought, wow, this guy knows science or something. <laughs> you know, he what he's saying is true. It's going to happen. So I, in order to make sure that my voice was always working, I would be constantly humming to myself. I'd be like, hmm, 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 like that kind of hum. And all day, every day for, for about two years, I would do this. And the, the purpose of the humming was to alleviate this distress and to check that my voice was still there. And then over the years, it kind of morphed into more serious versions of OCD. So in my teenage years, we, we mum and dad separated and, and me and my little brother went with mum and we're still living in that geographic location where it was quite, you know, there was pockets of, of crime and, and, and stuff like that and some dangerous areas. And all of a sudden I became this man of the house, this, this notion that, that you're the man of the house. I remember like TV back in the 80s and 90s would often say, oh, who's the man of the house? You know, kind of like married with children and all that type of stuff. You've got Ed Bundy, he's the man of the house. You've got home improvement, you know, I can't remember what the guy's name was. It was Tim Allen or something. He was the, he was the man Allen, of yeah. the house. And, <laughs> and, you know, so all these shows, like even the Cosby show, like, you know, Bill Cosby, he was the man, like these are the things that we watch on TV. And, and it's like, I'm like, okay, now I'm the man of the house at like, what, 13 years old or something like that. And so this is where OCD went into overdrive. And so I'd spend three, maybe four hours every night checking that the house was locked because I was fearful, overwhelmingly fearful, someone breaking into the house, stealing our stuff, kidnapping us, murdering us, stabbing us, all sorts of things. And so I would go around in a routine and, and obsessive compulsive disorder, you do things in routines because that's how you how you manage through it. So, for example, it might start at the front door, then progress to the front windows and, and continue around the whole house, making sure that any possible entry point was locked, secured. You know, I'm not the kind of guy that would would go to bed with a window open to get the nice fresh breeze because that would just petrify me. Even today, I would not do that because I just worry that someone would break in unless I was like up in a hotel room, like 50 stories up or whatever. There was no possible way for someone to break into the window, but I'd probably still think about it as well. So yeah, three to four hours a night doing this. And I'd, I'd check, I'd do the routine of checking. And then it would also include checking like the appliances were off. So like the iron, the stove, oven was off because I, I also had this f fear of the house burning down while we were sleeping. And so I'd, I'd check all this stuff. I'd go to bed. Then my brain would say, did you really check that window? Or when you check that door, it somehow magically unlocked. So off I'd go again, do the whole routine. And it wasn't just that window or that door. It was the whole routine again because it has to go in the routines. Someone with obsessive compulsive disorder does this repeatedly until everything feels just right. Okay, the windows are just right. The door's just right. The way that this curtain's draped over this window is just right. 
And and so during these times, you know, I was doing this for hours and hours and hours, but then on the way to school, I'd, I'd pack my bag and I'd have my wallet and my keys particularly, but also my school books as well. And I would check, have I got my wallet and keys? Because if I lost my wallet and keys, if I lost my wallet, had my like address on my identity card or whatever, so they'd have it. They'd someone, this baddie person in my head, that this mythical person, um, would know where I lived. And if they had the keys, they would have the means to get into the house. And so I would check my bag that I had my wallet and keys. I'd zip up my bag, put it on my back. Then my brain would say, "Simon, did you really zip up your bag?" And so I'd take it off, do it again, and then I put it back on. And they're like, they're like Simon, in the process of checking, did did your wallet or keys fall out onto the ground and you forgot to check? So pull it off again, do it again, check the ground. You know, do this constantly all day, every day. And, you know, that that lasted for a, a good 20 years, that particular one. I still do it a little bit today, that one, but nowhere near as bad as like particularly my teens. So it's really interesting that you bring that up because I've done stuff like mm. that. And it's not obsessive, but it's certainly like I've closed up something and I'm like, yeah, but is it really in there? Let me take a look. And it's for me, it's almost like this level of paranoia that did I, is this in here? Is this thing that I absolutely positively need in here? Mm. So as you were talking about that, I was like, oh man, I've done stuff like that. And I know that I'm <laughs> I'm obsessive about things, but when I hear people talk about OCD, we've had you on talking about OCD. People can go back to, I believe it's episode 62 with Brian Pyatt. He also talks about his battle with OCD. When I hear people talk about their OCD, I'm like, okay, well, like I'm not at that level of obsessive compulsive to where it's a point of disorder but there are mm. hints of it in there and as you were talking about that like my blood ran a little <laughs> cold because i have absolutely done yeah. things like that where i'm like well no, did it fall out i better check and in just re-zipping and zipping so whew, that was a bit yeah. real right there. That that really resonated. And for most people, they can just do it once and, and that's it. Like they just check and, and that's natural. Like I've heard people say, like I used to drive back 20 minutes when I got my license, drive back half an hour, 20 minutes to check again. I couldn't be late. That could make me late for work or, or for school, but I would just have... Okay, I feel a little better because I've never done that. So, like that that piece I know I've never done. So but there's other things okay. like when I got my license at 16, so 16 and a half here, you can kind of back then we could get our, our P plates, which means we could drive without a, a, a parent or an adult with us or whatever. And when I got my first car, then it turned into the car stuff as well. It turned into is the handbrake up fully? Because if the handbrake's not up, the car could roll back and cause, you know, someone to die or car accident or drive into someone's house or something like that because if it's on a slight hill or whatever. You know, I'd, even that and, like, the, where the light's off in the car because I've had this fear of breaking down. And this is before mobile phones. So if you broke down in the middle of nowhere, you'd have to trudge, you know, kilometres to a, a pay phone or, or knock on someone's house. And I would never knock on someone's house because of the anxiety of around you know, social anxiety that I had. And so I had this overwhelming fear that, you know, if the light was on in the car, the car battery would go flat. I didn't have money to get a new battery or to call someone out, so I didn't know that. So I was constantly processing and, and an OCD, my OCD mind, it's constantly processing risks and versus rewards or dangers or inconveniences to the nth degree. Like in our brains, like in an OCD brain, you 100% believe that if you don't do all these checking things, particularly for me, and it's not for everyone because there's lots of different types of OCD, I constantly believe, and a lot of people do, is that it will happen if you do not do the behavior. The 100% thought is going to happen. Your thought's going to happen. And so, yeah, to the car, and I remember I used to go to work all the time and or school, 
and I'd be in class and I'd have to say, can I go to the toilet or whatever? If I go in the toilet, I'm actually going to go check my car. This hasn't rolled down out of the school car park or out of the work car park and caused mayhem and the police and all this are looking for me because my I was irresponsible with how I parked my car. Like all these things would go through my mind constantly. Um, and so, yeah, in, in my teenage years, this is where I guess I call them my darkest days because all this was happening. I was exhausted. Also trying to be, you know, go to school, socialize, hide under the mask as well. So trying to live this, I'm living this double life. And I remember, you know, putting my head on the, on the pillow and saying, and saying to myself, I hope I don't wake up. I hope I suffocate and, and don't wake up again because I'm just over this. I can't do this anymore. I'm trying to outthink it. I'm trying to, to solve it on myself like most men do. They try to fix themselves in, in whatever ways. But then something told me like, Simon, like no matter how dark today is, the sun will always rise tomorrow. And I don't know where this came from, like, but it's become my little personal mantra and affirmation for when I'm in my dark times, I say to myself to this because I think, I associated the sun as a new a new day, a new chance to to do things differently, or even just also on um, many times it was the sun associated with just checking a little bit less because I didn't have to worry about the nighttime routine. All of a sudden I was in the daytime, so I'm like, oh, I can relax now. It's it's almost like it's funny when you say mental illness stuff out loud. Sometimes it sounds really ridiculous, but I use I like to use humor. I laugh at myself as well. Like it does sound like. Losing my voice sounds stupid <laughs> to me, but in my mind as an eight-year-old, it was, it was 100% true. But like saying it to myself, like, like yeah, I did do all these things, and I still do a lot of these things today, like at 39, but I just know how ridiculous they are now. So I've got more control over it now. But yeah, I said this mantra to myself and it became my little thing. And yeah, it was, I guess it's, that was the initial point where I started reflecting inwards, going, okay, something's not quite right. But I didn't confront that until, yeah, until I was 28 and, and, and got the help from the GP. And it sounds like that you thought that alcohol was going to be the thing that slowed down these thoughts. And so I think a lot of guys either turn to alcohol as a coping mechanism or they just never outgrow the alcohol mm. phase from their college days. They just keep it going because... They don't know how to slow it down. That's what happened mm. to me is it just all the way through my 20s. I just never figured out how to be a social yeah. drinker because it was just always balls to the walls. I was going to get blackout drunk every weekend and I didn't know how to drink socially. Like if I was going to have a drink, then I was going to have enough drinks to where I was just unruly, obnoxious, outrageous, that sort of thing. And it never allowed me the opportunity to be reflective mm. or mature. Like it stunted all of that, that social emotional learning, that growth that could have happened during that time. And so when you were using alcohol in order to slow your mind down, it's interesting because it's almost like you had this awareness that, hey, there's something going on here. Maybe booze is going to be the fix. Yeah, and it's, it's an interesting one because Australia's got a huge drinking culture. Like, it's huge. And, you know, you see alcohol advertising a lot. And, you know, even on our sports team, like, we, as I said before, we're, we're mad on sports. And so, like, sports teams would have alcohol, you know, branding on it and stuff like that. But And it's, it's challenging here because we're legally able to drink from 18, and buy alcohol from 18. And so our drinking often starts around 16. You know, we start getting, you know, the, the guy that can grow a beard early or whatever can walk through the bottle shop and, and pick up some alcohol or whatever. And so it's ingrained really young. And for me, it was two things. One, it was socialization. It was being part of the crew and having fun and all that type of stuff, but also like being able to relax as well. So, you know, a drink, and this is probably where the day dad moves came in, you know, have a few drinks and start, the body starts to, you know, be flexible and I can start to learn dance moves and, and all this stuff. And you associate all this stuff with drinking and, and, and getting drunk. And it's an interesting, a lot of guys have a saying here, I'm not sure what it's like over there, but my wife doesn't get it. But we say, I'm going for a beer and a beer actually means a couple beers. And then if you say, I'm going for a couple beers, that actually means not two, but it's like four to five beers. Or if you say, I'm going 
out drinking, you're going out and you're going to get smashed, basically. You're going to get drunk. Mm. And, and my wife's like, what do you mean? It's like, isn't a beer just like one beer? But I could never associate that with one beer. I could never just have the one beer. Like you said, like I could never drink socially. I had to drink to be social. And that was a lot in my younger days, like in those late teenage years when we're partying all the time, every weekend. I didn't go away for, for uni, but I hung around people that liked to drink a lot. So, you know, that would just became a, a normal part of my life. Every weekend we'd be getting drink, would have a cart and a beer or whatever and go through that. And so it just everything was normalized in that sense. And then as I grew older, then I'm like, oh, okay, I'm stressed from work. I need to go home and drink and, and then feel relaxed and, and stuff like that. But as I got older and, and it was around that 28 years old that I'm like, yeah, I am. Maybe I am drinking too much, but I never really nailed that on the head. I mean, you talk in yours about having a sabbatical away from alcohol and I never really did that. Like the longest, aside from like this current moment, so we're what recording what almost before Christmas, but like I haven't been drinking since for the last say three months or so. That's the longest I've ever like not drank since I was 16. And I think now as a dad, again, this is where the dad stuff comes out. Like my drinking, my kids started talking about beer. And I'm like, oh, they're, they're really noticing me sitting down and drinking a beer. And do I want them to associate dad with drinking beer on the couch by himself, watching the, the football on TV? Like, do I want that? Every now and then's okay, but do I, is that like an every weekend thing? Like, should I be doing that as a dad? Is that the best role model I can be for my son, you know, if he's going to be tempted to this? And my daughter as well. And so, you know, there's a lot of reflection that comes as you get older, but you've got to, you know, for me, I had to go through a lot of pain and hurt and silence and trial and error and, and all that type of stuff to get to that point of reflection. Initially to get the diagnosis, but then also as I get older, so as I get to, to what, 2020 when I experienced burnout, and I really experienced, you know, I really dived into therapy properly. Like in the eight years before that, I was hoping for the magical fix, the magical pill from psychologists and doctors that would fix me, but I never did the internal work. But then 2020, I experienced burnout and I started to do the internal work. I found mindfulness, you know, practices through my therapist and started to really apply the homework because I needed to. I was physically, emotionally, mentally spent. I had to have four months off of work, four to five months off of work and just work on me and, and self-care and, and filling my cup again. And it's there that I go, okay, maybe alcohol is part of this. You know, The social work study helped me identify some of this. So I start to learn about alcohol and the impacts on society and intergenerational trauma and, and you know, the way that you know, capitalism and consumerism like can really influence us like on at the micro levels and stuff like that. And so these all came together and I'm like, light bulb started going off. I'm like, okay, my journey is the way it has been for these particular reasons. Like we've talked about, like where I grew up and the, the influences around me. And then also this whole masculinity culture around bottling stuff up and, and, and all that type of stuff. And and mental illness as well. So the stigma and shame and, and all that associated. I think when I think back on COVID, like it did a lot of damage in the world, but one of the good things it did is it, it helped prompt people to talk more openly about mental illness. Because in, in Australia, we were locked down for five, six months at a time in certain areas, particularly that first one was a long one. And then Queensland, where I live, we went through multiple lockdowns. I think Melbourne and Victoria went through some of the world's longest lockdowns and it just sparked a whole bunch of mental health conversations. And from there, I can go, yeah, I'm taking off this mask and I'm joining this. I'm joining the mental health bandwagon and just putting myself out there. And that's where Mindful Men started. It started as a social media campaign just to talk about my story, but then it blossomed into the therapy business that I do now since I finished my social work degree and I'm kind of connecting the dot. Like I remember being in, in my late high school years going, I want to work with people like me. And what I meant by that was met people with mental health issues, but I didn't know that was a mental health thing, but I never got there. And I spent, so I went on this roundabout 15 year career in a, in a job I hated. Well, not a job I hated, but a career I didn't really like and didn't connect with. But yeah, finishing the social work degree and starting my own private practice I think connected that dot of wanting to work with, you know, guys with mental health issues. So, yeah, it's a long windy story, but yeah, like it, we get there in the end and I think that's a mental health story. It is windy and it, some days you feel like you're just going backwards 
Um, but you eventually do get there if you just got to have patience with it. So then now as you are navigating this work as a licensed social worker, how do you separate your own experiences from the men you work with so that you aren't intersecting your journey with theirs? Or do you find that sharing your journey gives you a bit of street cred with those guys? Uh, both. So there's elements where street cred does help because guys like to feel inspired by the people that they work with. And even in my own therapy practice, like my own personal therapy, the, the, the therapists that I connect with are the ones with shared experiences. So the one I had with burnout had experienced burnout as well. So I, I could really just talk the language and they could really understand what I was going through. And so if a guy talks to me about depression, I can say, man, I've been there. I've been suicidal. I know what it's like to feel low, but good therapists, and I really take pride in this, is is not overwhelming them with your story because it's their story. They're paying you to listen. Not you're not paying. You're not taking their money, but then sharing your story. And so, I leave a lot of that to the podcast and my social media stuff to share my story, so that I can say, look, if you want to hear more of my story, just go to go to my podcast. But in therapy, it's it's all about them and what their thoughts are and what they're experiencing. They can ask me for my opinion or strategies I've personally used, and I'll, I'll tell them. But I do just separate, you know, my therapy. I leave my story at the door, and I only bring in snips if I absolutely need to because it is their story. But it does give the street cred. The street cred is really important in mental health because if you can find someone who has shared experience of what you're you're going through. It just helps you connect with that therapist more. You're probably going to do the, the homework more like, you're going to be more likely to do the homework if they have that shared experience. Whereas if you just got someone with textbook smarts, they can tell you all the tools and tips in the world. But if they don't tell you it, if they don't like, haven't walked in the shoes, they're really only 50% there. You really want someone who's 75%, 80%, 100% with you. Um and that's, I guess, the purpose of when you're anyone's looking for a mental health therapist is shop around. Like you might start with one and you just feel a disconnect. That you, maybe you feel like they don't really get you to say thanks, but I'm going to try and find somebody else who does get me because they're the ones that you, you're really looking for. They're the gold nuggets um, where you can get some great work done. And that's when I bought into the, the mindfulness is when I, I found someone who was really uh, into mindfulness like the way I was and that kind of practice. And he was like a a Buddhist monk and I just wanted to go and sit on the mountain with him somewhere and, and do mindfulness <laughs> all the time. But we had our, our little snips and stuff like that and he was gem. But it took me a long time to find someone like that, um, someone who kind of could just speak my language, kind of talk about, give me tools that I bought into as well. Um, it's just a, a lot of it's trial and error. So, Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I shared my own mental health struggles in episode three. So way back at the beginning of this show when our production value was incredibly terrible. But when I shared that story, I got a lot of text messages from guy friends who were like, thank you so much for sharing your story. It got me thinking about a lot of things and it made me think about how, you know, some of the things that I've been thinking about, some of the things that I've been going on. And it actually inspired one of my friends to share that episode with his brother. And then the two of them came on the show. This is episode 11 with Scott and Lee Marotes. The two of them came on the show and they talked about how that episode opened up a conversation between the two of them about Lee's mental health struggles. And when you hear stories like that, it's like, man, that's why you create the show. Mm. Right. And I imagine that's why you do the work that you do because you've seen action being taken by men as a result of your vulnerability, your willingness to open up. When I was on your show, we talked about this podcast. It's a six part podcast from my hero, Henry Rollins, where he traveled around Australia having these tough conversations with various men from the land down under to discover what tough actually means and and how tough has evolved. And he, he was really kind of highlighting sort of this mysticism of the toughness that is often thought of when we when we think of the Australian outback, right? So do you see much of a difference between how men in Australia are raised 
to address their mental health and how other people from around the world are raised to address their mental health. Because, you know, like we've said, there's this ruggedness that we associate with men from Australia, men from the outback. Yeah, I guess, I guess one of the things is that we, most of us don't live in the outback. <laughs> it's, it's, we all live on the coast. We're all a bit like, um, you know, the East Coast particularly, we're all a bit surfy and, and all that type of stuff. But it, it's it's an interesting one because I, since I started the podcast as well, like my, the Mindful Men podcast, and I'm having conversations with people just like you across the world, like it's actually quite interesting how we can be separated by land and sea and even in different decades as well, grow up in different decades, but we all share very similar journeys in terms of particularly men, like the bottling up thing about, you know, bottling it up, not sure how to talk about it, not sure how to express it and all that type of stuff. So it's actually quite a common response that I'm seeing both in the podcast, but also in the work that I do in the, in the therapy practice as well. But in the mental health space, what's really interesting is is we often feel like we're the only person in the world experiencing what we're experiencing like for me ocd like they call ocd a silent condition or a silent disorder and takes on average someone what, between 13 15 17 years depending on which literature you, lit, which literature you read um from first symptom to first treatment because they're they're, they're trying to out out think it out out be it in their own body and and for a lot of people it's quite distressing they don't want to talk about it because they fear the response that they might get for talking about something. So, for example, if you have like harm OCD and you have thoughts of stabbing someone because you're holding a knife, it doesn't mean you want to stab someone. It's just a thought that you're stabbing, you want to stab someone. You try saying that to a GP or a psychologist or something like that. If you're worried that they might, you know, child safety or child protection might come and take your kids away or your, your wife might pick up all your gear and her gear and just leave because she's worried about her safety, it's... it's it's one of those things that can be really challenging and, and hard to talk about. But once you do start talking about it, it's and I've heard this so many times in my own personal recovery, particularly when I started approaching my OCD in my own therapy, is is how many times psychologists, counsellors, GPs, or people in general have heard the stories before. Well, I was just going to say, it's incredible that you use that example about the knife because in that episode of Brian Pyatt, he uses that exact example. Mm. He talks about like when he was a kid, he remembers having that thought of what if I picked up this knife and stabbed my mom? And then very quickly he was like, wait a minute, but I, I love my mom. Why, why mm. would I do that? But then that intrusive thought was there. And so it's just so incredible that you use that as your example right there. Yeah, and I haven't listened to that episode, so maybe I'm psychic. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst all your other mental health superpowers, right? You also are psychic. <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, but maybe I've got to start a new podcast, the psychic side. I'm not sure. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. Like for me, like living with OCD, it wasn't until I started my Instagram page. A couple of years ago, two years ago, from my burnout recovery as a way of just talking about mental health, that I even discovered other people in the world live with OCD. I found all these people. I just started searching like for other accounts to follow. I'm like, oh, I'm like, I might try and see if there's other OCD accounts, and there's millions of them. Like, there's huge amounts of people living with OCD. So, like, we're actually one of the most common mental health conditions. But we always talk about depression when we talk about mental illness, but OCD is quite common. And, and so I'm like, oh, wow, like if I didn't open up, start this Instagram thing and start sharing my story and then just got curious and started diving into you know, OCD accounts on Instagram, I would have never have found these people and I would never have probably found exposure and response prevention, which is the therapy that is apparently the gold standard for OCD treatment. So it's like comes under the the umbrella of cognitive behavioral therapy, but it focuses less on the cognitions, so the thoughts, and more on just preventing the behaviors from happening. So preventing you, you know, checking the the doors and windows, or checking the handbrake, or driving back home twenty minutes. It's, it's all around focusing on that. But it all comes from being open and discovering what it means to be a man, what it means to be tough, and accepting where you know, vulnerability in our lives, and and going, okay, maybe there's something you're not quite right here. 
and and I guess not conforming to this notion that men need to be tough and emotionless and, and, and stuff like that. You know, like that rugged outback guy who, in fact, when we think about the outback, there's so many guys out there in rural and regional Australia that are struggling, like farmers and all that. They're isolated. They're lonely. They're they're disconnected from the world, from technology. Like, you know, they can't even access internet and stuff like that. Healthcare providers. So that's what Henry Rollins was trying to highlight Mm. is these guys that are out there and dealing with isolation or these guys who are out in the outback and who are gay and really can't live authentically. Mm. Right. And when I think of the outback in Australia, I think about the American West because the American West states like Wyoming states like Idaho, those are really isolated states because of the Rocky mountains. It's rugged out that way. The, the, I mean, Wyoming has a population, I think it's less than a million people. It's a huge state in terms of land mass, very few people. And so people are spread out all over the place. And Unfortunately, there is this middle-aged suicide epidemic that is taking over the American West that we're really not talking about. Mm. And there are no resources that are available or the stigma and shame that surrounds men's mental health, particularly if you're someone who has been a rancher, Mm. if you are someone who has been a laborer like many in the the American West, there's no way that you would feel comfortable or vulnerable enough to check in with a therapist because what does that say about your masculinity right there? Mm, absolutely. This isn't an attack on masculinity either. I think it's important for people to go back and listen to the episode that I did with Pradeep Sangha, episode 67, where we talk about the complete man, where he talks about wanting to cultivate more mindful alpha males, right? And he promotes masculinity, but an aspect of masculinity is your awareness of what's going on with you and your environment and then having the capacity to do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's all of those things entwined and, and you know, we think about you know, the our farmers particularly, like, you know, in, in Outback Australia, we've had drought for years, like decades it feels like, drought. You know, we've got the lineage of like the kids are moving away from regional rural Australia to live on the coast because there's just more opportunities the money's not there for to continuing the family farms and all that type of stuff. And so these these men particularly, and women as well, they're feeling the isolation, you know, they're feeling like I've got to carry on and, and be this masculine version that I've grown up with. And, and a lot of it's in, enshrined in the way that we were brought up by our parents. And it's no attack on our parents either. Like, I, like I'd never, I don't sit back and go, my mum and dad did the worst job raising me. They just did the best job that they knew that they could. Like they didn't know mental health wasn't a discussion that we had in the 80s and 90s. So why would they talk about mental health? Like why would I talk about it? Because I didn't even know that those words went together, you know. Like I knew about physical health because I played football and stuff like that. But And if we got injured, I want to get back on the footy field as, as quickly as possible, but certainly not mental health. And, and so, you know, these generations of, you know, people in the outback, people on the coast as well, like a lot of 90, I think it's 80 or 90% of Australia's population lives on the coastline. And, you know, no matter where you are, like there's a lot of people experiencing this and not sure how to talk about these types of issues and unwilling in a lot of cases because of that fear of, of what other people are going to say about them. So I think it all comes down to just trying to, it, it's hard because I remember 10 years ago, me going in and saying, I think I've got a mental health issue to my GP was going against all the grain that I learned growing up on the footy field or in, in the household with three brothers and dad or watching Die Hard and Terminator. It just goes against all that grain because I was saying, I've got some vulnerability here. I'm I'm not this postcard version of what ever masculinity is meant to look like. But I liked how you were saying it is, is around trying to develop these mindfully masculine guys. It's a really good thing. And seeing a whole wave of dads, for example, in the dad space who want to be the stay-at-home dads 
and, and they want to be there for their kids and, and teach their kids ways of dealing with emotional distress and being open and stuff like that. And, you know, I tried it for a little while and it was amazing to be able to spend more time at home with the kids and stuff like that and challenge those social constructs of men have to be the breadwinner, men have to go out and, and work and the wife stays at home and all that type of stuff. And the more we can challenge this stuff and talk about it openly and honestly and so forth, I think the better that our future generations will be. I think this is a time where we're starting this mental health conversation and the more momentum we can get, the more we can we can normalise discussions around mental health, which is great what we're doing now, which is normalising a mental health discussion. It's not behind closed doors. It's going to be open for the whole world to hear it. The further we can progress this this mindfully masculine guy for the future. Well, one of the areas you focus on in your social work is fatherhood. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break, and then we come back, we're going to talk to Simon about, we're going to talk to Simon about how fatherhood impacts his own mental health and how fatherhood challenges him to be a better father in, in, in terms of managing his mental health and what advice he gives to fathers in order to manage their mental health. Thank you for listening to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. Hey, if you enjoyed this week's episode, you may want to check out these other episodes as well. We've got episode two where my good friend and old co-host Brian on the Base and I discuss research from the Samaritans Project about what factors may be driving middle-aged men to suicide, which is an important topic to discuss because middle-aged men have the highest rates of suicide in any demographic. And quite frankly, I don't think people are talking enough about this mental health crisis for middle-aged men. You can also listen to episode three, where I share my story of navigating my own mental health crises, using mindfulness as my guide out of a life of despair. You can check out episode five, where Brian on the base shares his struggles with alcohol. We've also got episode 11, where we talk to brothers Scott and Lee Marotes about how this very podcast help the two of them open up to each other about their mental health issues. Be sure to check out one of my favorite guests, episode 22 with Tandra Rutledge, where we discuss how to prioritize and normalize mental health conversations with our children. We also had on Michael Mosher, episode 46. He shares his mental health journey. And then finally, we talked to Brian Pyatt in episode 62. He talks to us about how OCD has impacted his life and how he uses both meditation and medication to balance out his mental health. You can find links to all of these episodes in the show notes, or you can get them wherever you get your podcasts. All of Simon's contact information, including links to his mental health services, are also available in the show notes. Hey, don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple listener, leave a five-star review with a few kind words. And if you're a Spotify listener, click those five stars under the show art. If you'd like to share your thoughts on this week's episode, you can find all of my contact information in the show notes as well. Feel free to email me your takeaways from this conversation at mindfulmidlifecrisis at gmail.com. You can also follow me and DM me on Instagram at mindful underscore midlife underscore crisis, or you can send a message through the contact page at www.mindfulmidlifecrisis.com. And while you're there, feel free to sign up for the newsletter so you can get access to the free meditations I send out every Sunday. Finally, I know Simon and I would greatly appreciate it if you would share this episode with the people in your life who may benefit from Simon's expertise and life experiences. The purpose of this show is to help you navigate the complexities and possibilities of life's second half, and we hope this conversation provides you with some insight to help you reflect, learn, and grow. So for Simon, this is Billy. Thank you for listening to The Mindful Midlife Crisis. May you feel happy, healthy, and loved. Take care, friends. Thank you for taking the time to listen to The Mindful Midlife Crisis podcast. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If this episode resonates with you, please share it with your family and friends. We will do our best to put out new content every Wednesday to get you over the midweek hump. If you want episodes to be downloaded automatically to your phone each week, all you need to do is hit the check mark, subscribe, like, or follow button, depending on what podcast format you're using. While you're at it, feel free to leave our show a quick five-star review with a few kind words so more people like you can easily find our show. If you're really enjoying the show and you want to help us out, 
Feel free to make a donation to www.buymeacoffee.com backslash MMC podcast. That's www.buymeacoffee.com backslash MMC podcast. You can also access the link in our show notes. We use the money from these donations to pay whatever expenses we incur from producing the show. But ultimately, we record this show for you. So if you keep listening, we'll keep recording and releasing new episodes each week regardless. If you'd like to contact us or if you have suggestions about what you'd like us to discuss on future episodes, feel free to email us at mindfulmidlifecrisis at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram at mindful underscore midlife underscore crisis. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to the articles and resources we reference throughout the show. Thanks again for listening. May you feel happy, healthy, and loved.